Wow. Come on. Somebody give Jesus some praise in this place today. Oh, come on. You could do better than that, Victory. Come on. If there was ever a weekend for you to give God your best praise, it would be this weekend. Come on. If you know he's been faithful when you were faithless, come on. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. Hallelujah. Woo. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Don't get comfortable. You might be back up again. Come on. How many of you glad to be in the house of God tonight? Isn't this awesome? I'm telling you, it is always good to be at Victory, but especially on this anniversary weekend. Come on, somebody. 29 years. 29 years of God's faithfulness, of his grace. It's kind of funny. When I was coming in, I flew in uh, from the great country of Texas. Um, <laughs> from the city of Dallas. And because I do live in Dallas, um, as soon as the Cowboys lose, the NFL season is just over for me. I just, I don't pay attention. So I walked in the airports, all these people greeting me and saying, welcome to Atlanta and balloons everywhere. And I just forgot what weekend it was. I said, look at victory. Got people all in the airport with balloons celebrating. And I remember there's a little game going on. But, but uh, man, what an incredible weekend to be here. And, and certainly uh, God's favor is on this church. God's hand is on this church, and so many things to celebrate. But you understand, uh, none of this would be possible if two people didn't say yes to the call of God. I want us, come on, somebody, to give honor to where honor is due. And thank God for Pastor Dennis and Pastor Colleen for who they are, for their obedience. Come on, 29 years of faithfulness, 29 years of preaching the gospel. 29 years of leading this church. Y'all got to do better than that. 29 years of praying for you, of believing for you. 29 years of standing at the gateway of hell and redirecting traffic, saying, no, you got 29 years. We honor you. We celebrate you. We thank God for you. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever felt like quitting. Uh, but thank you for not quitting. I, uh, I'm, I'm just in a season of my life where faithfulness is so sexy. Come on, somebody. You can find anybody to have intensity, but when you got somebody with consistency, they are the real MVP. So I'm just glad to have my chocolate face in the place. We're going to have fun uh, in here tonight. Um, anytime I have this microphone and a special lady is here, I'm going to honor her. I'm so thankful for a spiritual mom in my life. Pastor Jeannie Mayo is here, and I want to honor who she is. Help me thank God for her. Come on, y'all are blessed with a jewel, a crown jewel from heaven, and I honor you. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to preach this word. I got to get to it. Um, not too much has changed. I'm still married to the finest woman on the planet. Uh, we've been married for uh, six years, four months, eight days, two minutes, and four seconds. And uh, well, well, one thing has changed. We've had another addition. I think last time we were here, we had two little humans. Uh, now we have three. Amen. So let me be that dad. Y'all got that picture of my babies? Put them on the screen. Come on, Victory. I made that. I made that. That's my oldest in the middle. Her name is Everly. I call her Evie. She's the reason that my prayer life is at a whole nother level right now. That, that's my son to the right of her, Robert Madhu III, my man child. He just turned one a couple of days ago. And then our newest and last addition, amen, uh, <laughs> Remington Elaine. I call her Remy Ma, and she's just one. Uh, so that's the Madhu crew. I put up their pictures all the time because fatherhood is the best hood. Just nothing like being a dad, amen. Hey, are you ready for the word? How many have been enjoying this free series? Hadn't it been awesome? And I really believe God's given me a, a word, really a life message for me that's really going to uh, fit in with what's already been said in this house. So I want to jump straight to it. Go to 2 Timothy with me today. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to look at verses 1 through 7. And also Genesis chapter 2 verse number 7. If you had a Bible, would you wave it in the air like you just do care? Come on. Some of your Bibles are glowing. You charged up your Bible today. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll look at verses 1 through 7, and then Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. If 
you need some time to find it, say, hold up. All right, I'll wait for you. <laughs> Even though it's going to be on the screen. Amen. <laughs> Look at what it says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lewis and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, hashtag don't be scared, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Can you say amen? amen. That is good stuff all by itself. Uh, go with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. Uh, just one verse of scripture there. It doesn't look like it'll make sense, but we'll make it make sense by the end. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, reading from the message translation. And it says, God formed man out of dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. Can you say amen? I'm going to preach to you in this free series using this as a title, It's In You. It's In You. Would you do me a favor and just look at your neighbor, the one you like the best? And uh, get in their face, get in their personal space. And would you just say this, say neighbor? Come on, don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor at Victory. This is a friendly church. Come on, say neighbor. Everything you need to do what God's called you to do, it's in you. Ooh, just in case that neighbor was stuck up, find you another neighbor, find you another neighbor. Come on, say other neighbor. I'm telling you. Everything you, need, Everything you need, it's in you. Come on, if you believe that thing, would you give God some praise in advance like he's going to speak? Woo. Come on, let's pray before we go into this. It's going to be a long prayer, uh, but bear with me. Would you bow your heads? God, you are awesome. Speak tonight. Amen. It's in you. A quick little sermonic survey how many would say, just by a showing of hands, that you were raised in church? Can I see your hand if you were raised in church? Oh, Lord, that's almost everybody. Hold on. Keep it lifted. Keep it lifted. Raised in church? Ooh. I just need to see who needs the counseling. Uh, no, I'm playing. I'm playing. Um, I I'll lift up my hand with you, and I'll let you know that I, too, was raised in church. And if you lifted up your hand, then you are acutely aware of the fact that the life of a church kid is distinctly different than the life of a regular kid. Oh, come on, somebody. There are trials and tribulations <laughs> and situations that you go through as a church kid that other kids aren't even aware of. Okay, I know this too well because growing up in our household, we had to be in church. Every day the doors were open, had to be in church. There were no discussions, there were no debates or diatribes. Uh, it was not a democracy, it was a dictatorship, okay? <laughs> we had to be in church. In fact, I'm so glad my father is here to corroborate this story. Because I'll never forget one Sunday, I think I was like 13, and I woke up feeling kind of bold, feeling brave, feeling gangster. And... Uh, <laughs> I said to my father, I said to my father, I said Ooh, to my Nigerian father, <laughs> I said, I ain't going this Sunday. I don't feel like it. I said that to my Nigerian father. And do you know what my Nigerian father said to me? Ooh. He said, let me tell you something, boy. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me tell you something, okay? You have two options, huh? You can get out of that bed and go to church, or I can kill you. And we will go to church and have your funeral. But either way, you will be in church. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is a true story. Y'all clapping at the abuse I endure. Um, dinners. Dinners were different. Dinners were different in our house because you could not eat your food. You could not touch your plate without my mama hitting you with this question. What's your favorite scripture? 
Before you could eat your food, you had to give a scripture. Before you could touch the plate, you had to give a scripture. Victory, you don't know hunger until your mind is racing through the Bible, just trying to find a scripture so you can eat your food. I remember one dinner being so exasperated with my mama, I looked at her and said, Jesus wept. Give me the chicken. Why are you playing with people's food? <laughs> That is the environment that I grew up in. And uh, to be honest, I'm thankful that's the environment that I grew up in. But, but tonight, for our journey, I kind of want to invert the question that my mom asked at the dinner table. And not ask you what your favorite scripture is, but ask you, have you ever considered what your least favorite scripture is? Because I know mine. We read it tonight. It is in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says that God created man from the very dirt of the earth. Ooh. Just let that scripture bless you for a minute there. If you are ever tempted to be saved and stuck up, or to be anointed and arrogant and just kind of think you all that and a can of Pringles, you need to read Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, because the Bible is clear that none of us came from some celestial substance, but every single one of us came from nothing but... I want to do an exercise that's going to help your self-esteem tonight. Would you do me a favor? Just look at the person to your left. Look at them real good. Mm -hmm. Look at the person to your right. Look at them real good. Look at the person behind you. Look at them real good. Uh huh. Look at the person in front of you. Watch this. You, you may think you have nothing in common with the person you looked at. You're wrong. Every single you person you looked at, according to the word of God, is a dirt bag. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I'm not trying to offend you. I, I'm being biblical because the Bible is clear that we came from nothing but dirt. And it is funny to me to think about all the things that we do for our dirt. Like, come on, you got up this morning, you washed your dirt. You, you put deodorant. I hope you put deodorant on your dirt. Ladies, the money you spend on your dirt. Oh, you get your dirt manicured. You get your dirt pedicured. And all that Mary Kay and Mac maker on dirt. All the things that we do for our dirt. There are people in this room who have the nerve, the audacity to take their smart device and hold it in the air like this and take about a hundred pictures because you know the first one you post is not the first one you took. And they will put the best picture of themselves on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter talking about hashtag selfie. No hashtag dirty because you came from nothing Ooh, I'm going somewhere but dirt this ooh, is dirt this is you I, I love it because I mean you know, we didn't mess up the victory budget tonight getting this dirt okay about a dollar and 99 cents and I took issue with this I took issue with this because hear me dirt has never had a positive connotation in society when we say things like you better watch your mouth you got a dirty mouth when you want to talk about the frugality of somebody's spending habits you say man you are as cheap as but that's where we came from. It, it becomes further problematic when you consider, when you consider that we serve a God that does everything with beauty, that does everything with splendor. How many know we serve an awesome God? Oh, come on. If you've ever seen a sunset, you've seen the handiwork of God. If you've ever seen the stars as they shine in the darkness, you've seen the workmanship of our God. He does not do anything ordinary. He does everything extraordinary. You do know he's the interior designer of heaven. Oh, he did the streets in gold. He did the gates in pearl. But when he got ready to create you and I, his prized possession, the one he sent his only son to die on a cross for, of all the things he could have used, he said, let's use Ooh, I was so mad. I was so mad. I said, hold on, God. Streets get gold, but we get dirt. That's messed up. Then God started speaking to me. And he said, Robert, don't get mad get glad. And he started revealing to me, hear me, the revelation that is encapsulated within the creation process. Because victory since the beginning of time, God has been trying to teach us something about who he is and about what he can work with. And hear me, you ought to thank God tonight because you serve a God who is holy but he's not afraid to work with things that are dirty. You serve a God who is awesome, 
but yet he can work with things that are messed up and awful. You serve a God who is magnificent, but he can work with things that are mundane and ordinary. And I just want to pause and thank God that in a society where everybody says, get that dirt away from me, get that messed up person away from me, God says, no, bring me that dirt. Bring me that person you think I can't use. Bring me that person you think that is too messed up. I will put my hands on that dirt. I will shape that dirt. As a matter of fact, I will breathe in that dirt and that dirt will come alive and become a living soul. Come on, is there anybody that's thankful tonight that God can work with dirt? See, if you stuck up, you can't praise God for that. But, but, but if you know you got some issues and some of your issues have issues, you ought to thank God that he does not need clean, pristine, Pinterest perfect people to get the glory out of their life. But only God can take a great mess and turn it into greatness and he can work with dirt. Ooh, can I take you deeper? Hear me. Dirt is the only environment that is conducive for a seed. See, see, you cannot put a seed in a diamond. You cannot put a seed in a pearl. I don't care how giant the tree, how nutritious the vegetation, or how beautiful the flower. If the gardener never places the seed in dirt, it will never reach its optimum potential. And I want to submit to you that although you came from dirt, how many know there has been a seed that's been deposited on the inside of you? And that seed is a gift. Oh, and the day you realize what that gift is, that's when your life can have true freedom. That's when you can do what God has called you to do. There is a seed, a gift that God has put in you before the foundation of the earth, and the world is waiting for you to stir it up. Oh, maybe that's why the Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that it is Christ that is in us that is the hope of glory. I feel like preaching, but let me calm down and be an exege exegetical engineer who effectively and efficiently excavates and extrapolates the complexities hidden within the crevices of a biblical composition. Uh, Get a translation. I just want to break this text down a little bit if I can. I, I love this text that we read because it's the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, about the need, hear me, to be a good steward of the gift that God has given him. And I love that Paul is writing this because who else but Paul is qualified to tell somebody to stir up the gift of God on the inside of them. You want to talk about somebody that was free. Paul was free. Even though he was always in jail, he was free. He knew how to stir up the gift of God on the inside of him. You understand that Paul would write a letter, a letter, and revival would break out in the city from Paul writing a letter. If Paul was alive today, you would get a text, a tweet, an email from Paul that would revolutionize your life. You understand he wrote two thirds of your New Testament. Paul was off the chain. Everywhere he went, they tried to stop his gift because he was so effective at doing what God had called him to do. They tried to shut him down, but they couldn't. They said, Paul, we're going to kill you. He said, that's cool because to die is gain. They said, okay then, Paul, we're going to let you live. He said, that's cool because to live is Christ. They said, okay then, Paul, we're going to make you suffer. He said, that's cool too because I've already reckoned that the present suffering of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory of God that's going to be revealed on the inside of it. Paul, he was off the chain. And he's telling Timothy, whatever you do, stir up what God has put on the inside of you. That's where your freedom is in stirring up your gift. But you can't really appreciate what Paul is saying until you understand the context from which Paul is saying this. Because Paul is writing this from a jail cell. And scholars and theologians are unanimous in their declaration that 2 Timothy is the last thing that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's one of the last things he wrote. He's literally on death row as he's writing this. So when you read 2 Timothy, you are really eavesdropping into the psychology of a man who knows that he is about to die. Why is that important? It's important because there's something about a consciousness of death that will clarify what's really important in your life. Oh, come on, somebody. If I told you today that you only had 24 hours to live, how many know eating some guacamole tomorrow and watching Tom Brady would not be that important to you? <laughs> come on, you would want everything that you said and everything that you did to carry great weight and significance because you would be fully aware of the fact that you are running out of time. So I find it intriguing. Of all the things Paul could have written about in the last moments of his life, he feels the need to tell Timothy, Timothy, whatever you do, 
Stir up what God has put on the inside of you. I'm telling you, I love you, Victory, but if they're about to kill me, if I'm on death row and I get to write you a letter, the last thing I'm going to write you a letter about is about stirring up your gift. If they're about to kill me and I'm going to write a letter, I'm writing one letter. Don't kill me. Exclamation point. But not the Apostle Paul. He said, well, if I don't tell you anything else, I got to tell you to stir up what God has put on the inside of you. Why would Paul do that? Because ultimately that is all that life is about. What did you do with what he put in you? Oh, come on. When you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you what your favorite worship song was. He's not going to ask you if you were a Democrat or Republican or if you knew how to jump up on the best part of a message. He's going to want to know, what did you do with the gift? What did you do with the dream? What did you do with what I put on the inside of you? Are you exhaling what I inhaled inside of you before the foundation of the earth? And then I'll be honest with you today. I'm scared of a couple of things. I'm... I'm scared of dogs. I don't do dogs. I had a bad childhood experience. I'm, I'm scared of heights. I'm scared of heights. Even this is a little bit too much for me. I'm scared. I'm scared of snakes. I don't do, I don't do snakes. But above dogs and heights and snakes, you know what I'm really afraid of? I'm afraid that when I get to heaven, God would flash up on the screen all the things that I did for him. And then he'll flash up on another screen all the things that I could have done with what he put in me. And what I did will dim in comparison to what I could have done. This is what wakes me up every morning to know that there is a gift on the inside of me. I'm wondering, do you know there is a gift on the inside of you? And this is your year to stop playing games, stop worrying about what other people think about you, and finally step into freedom and stir up what God has put on the inside of you. Oh, I love what one writer says. He says, the tragedy of life is not death, but rather what we let die inside of us while we still live. Another writer says that the wealthiest place on earth is the cemetery. Because buried in the cemetery are dreams that never became a reality. Buried in the cemetery are songs that we never got to sing, books that we never got to read, businesses that we never got to see because the person did not stir up what God put on the inside of them. But come on, God sent me all the way from Dallas, Texas to tell you the grave cannot get what you are holding. Come on, this is your moment to stir it up. Somebody say, stir it up. Oh, come on, wake up your neighbor. Say, stir it up. Come on, wake up that other neighbor and say, stir it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you go, if you go to my parents' house in Dallas and you go to the backyard, what you're going to see there is a peach tree. There's this big old peach tree there. And uh, the way that peach tree got there is uh, when I was a kid, I loved eating peaches. And I'll never forget being a kid and I ate this peach and I got down to the seed. And being the precocious kid that I was, I went to my father. I said, Dad, what is this? He said, son, that's the seed. Actually, let's keep it 100. He said, son, that is the seed. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yes. He said, son, do you know, huh, if you take that seed and you plant it in the ground, a peach tree will come up. I said, no, on daddy. He said, son, it is true. So true story, my father and I, we go to the backyard, I'll never forget it, we plant this seed, and I am so excited about having my own peach tree. I am so excited about this peach tree. I'm going to school the next day saying, I'm going to have a peach tree, I'm going to have a peach tree. I was like, y'all can have some of my peaches. Y'all were hating on me, you can't have none of my peaches. <laughs> so excited about this peach tree. A after we plant it, the next day, the next day, I go outside to get my peaches. To my shock, there is no peach tree. I said, okay, all right, maybe it needed a day. Next day, no peach tree. Next day, no peach tree. Next day, no peach tree. By the eighth day, I don't even want to go outside anymore. I am inside the house. My nose is pressed up against the window pane. One tear is slowly cascading down my face because I don't have my peach tree. My father walks in, sees me crying in classic Nigerian fashion, says, what is wrong with you? Why, why are you crying? I said, don't talk to me, liar. You ain't nothing but a liar. Don't talk to me, liar. Side note, if your father is Nigerian, don't call him a liar, okay? Discipline is high on their priority list, okay? So are you calling me a liar? Are you calling your father a liar? Boy, I brought you in this world. I will take you. No, hold on. I'm saying you a liar. I'm just saying. You said I was going to have a peach tree. There's no, no peach tree. My dad said, Come here, boy. I'll never forget it. Takes me to the backyard. We both stood over where we planted it. He asked me a critical question. 
He says, have you done anything with this since we planted it? I said, no. He said, son, listen to me. Every day you come home from school, go and get the water hose and water what we planted. Stop crying like a little baby and go and get the water hose and you water what we planted. I hope somebody sees where I'm going with this today. Because there are so many believers who have their nose pressed up against the window pane of their life. And you think God lied about what he was going to do in you and through you. And God's going, no, I didn't lie. I've just been waiting on you to stir up what I put on the inside of you. You got to do something with what he put in you. You got to stir it up. Somebody say stir it up. I'm so glad that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy because he was actually giving us incredible theological truths that when God puts something on the inside of you, the onus is not just on God, but it is on you too. It is a responsibility on you. It is a collaboration between God and man that causes his purposes to come forth in the earth. And you got to stir it up. Somebody say, stir it up. Oh, come on. Say it like you believe that thing. Say, stir it up. Oh, come on, say it like you're going to be free and this is going to be the best year you ever had. Say, stir it up. Oh, stir it up. Stir past worry. Stir past fear. Stir past insecurity. Stir past anxiety. Stir past depression. Stir past all the pain of your past. Stir past what other people said about you and said you'll never be. Somebody say, stir it up. Oh, and once you begin to stir it up, you begin to see, wait a minute. Oh. There is a gift on the inside of me. You know what I love about the illustration? Is none of you knew that was in there, except for me. You know why? Because I'm the one that put it in there. I'm trying not to tell the church up. See, that's why I get excited when haters and naysayers come in my life and they say, no, I don't see you doing that. No, I don't see that happening. No, not in Atlanta. Of course you don't see it. You didn't put anything in me. But there is a God that put a gift on the inside of me. And as soon as I stir it up, oh, come on, somebody ought to give them some praise in this place today. Stir it up. Stir up. This is the greatest day of your life. This is the day is your real birthday right here. The day you realize what he put in you. You want to talk about freedom? The day you see what he put in you, this is the greatest day of your life. In fact, there is an African proverb that says there's two important days in your life. Not the day you're born and the day you die, but the day you're born and the day you find out why you were born. What? is your gift. Hear me, just as sure as I'm holding this gift in my hand, every single person in this room, every single person, every single person in this room has a gift. Something God has given you. And I'm wondering, have you figured it out yet? Some people find out at four. Some people find out at 40. But my goodness, please find out before you leave this earth what he put in you. What is your gift? Come on, I could talk all night about the gifts that are in this room. How many are thankful for your worship team? Aren't they awesome? Come on, Montel and the whole team just... That's their gift. That's their gift. I mean, we got business leaders in here. We got all kinds of doctors and lawyers and physicians and teachers and all kinds of people here. You have a gift. Do you know what your gift is? That's what God wants to use. In fact, let me explain why some people, especially in the church, don't realize that they have a gift. Because the church does real good at displaying stage gifts. Stage gifts. So sometimes you walk in, you're like, well, I can't sing like Montel. I can't preach like Pastor Dennis, so maybe I don't have anything to offer. Are you crazy? It is your gift in your unique sphere in the marketplace that God wants to use, I believe, especially in these last days, to bring glory to his name. Do you know what your gift is? Because you got something. Oh, in fact, let me give you some practicality. Here's some questions you can ask yourself to find out what your gift is. Number one, what do you like to do? What do you like to do? Our gifts are hidden within our passions. Our gifts are hidden in our passions. What is something that causes a certain emotion 
to rise up on the inside of you. Emotions are horrible dictators, but they are great indicators. Sometimes the reason why your heart beats fast about something or something breaks your heart, we just heard tonight about something that broke her heart and look at what God did because it was something that was drawing her to it. What is your passion? What do you like to do? Here's another question. What would you do for free if nobody pays you to do it? What would you do for free? I know some people who make a whole lot of money but are frustrated and kicking the dog and the cat and taking the goldfish out of the tank because they settled for a paycheck instead of their God-given passion. And they got a whole lot of money, but they're not doing what God created them to do. What would you do for free? Ooh, see, God's blessed me. I get to travel all over the world and preach, and this is how I make my living. But if I didn't, this is still what I would be doing. I was created to do this right here. If I was in Australia with no humans, I would still be preaching to kangaroos, talking about, hey, get that stuff out of your pouch. There's another level you can hop to. Come on, quit playing. God's got more in store for you. That's what I was created to do. What would you do for free? What would you do for free? Here's another question. What do other people see in you? What do other people see in you? That's why you got to have the right circle around you this year because sometimes people will see things in us that we don't even see in ourselves. I remember growing up in the church, I never wanted to be a preacher. Never wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to be an actor. I figured I look like Denzel. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I may as well act. And I'll never forget doing a little silly drama before I got, went on stage and I was sharing a devotion with our youth group. My youth pastor overheard me sharing a devotion with our youth group that was doing the drama. And he said, Robert, You've got an incredible gift to articulate the word of God. I think he's going to use you to preach the gospel. And I looked at him and said, I don't know what you're smoking. I'm going to Hollywood <laughs> to be an actor. <laughs> but he saw something in me at 13 I didn't see in myself. What do other people see in you? Here's another question. Ooh, it's going to bless somebody. What frustrates you? What frustrates you? Ooh, you are often anointed for what annoys you. See, a lot of people come into church and they notice stuff and something will frustrate them. Like, I cannot believe that they didn't do this or I can't believe they don't have that. Not realizing that sometimes that frustration is an indication of an area of ministry that you're called to serve in. But it's easier to sit back and complain rather than roll up your sleeves and say, let me get involved. Come on, if you notice they weren't smiling at the door, hello, you're supposed to be a greeter. <laughs> come on. If you notice the wrong note, not here, but if you notice the wrong note, hello, you might be called to be on the worship team. The rest of us didn't know it. We just tone deaf. We just worshiping Jesus, having a good time. Your annoyance, what annoys you, your frustration is an indication of what your true gifting is. Now, if you notice something about everything, you just got a demon and need to be delivered. But <laughs> what is your gift? What frustrates you? Now, I could end the sermon right there. I could end the sermon right there. Stir up your gift, see your gift, and that would be a good way to land the message. But I can't land the message there without warning you that the day you identify your gift, the day you find out what he put you on this earth to do, get ready for all hell to break loose in your life. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Because if there's anybody the enemy hates, it's somebody who has identified their gift. If there is anybody that is on the hit list of hell, it is somebody who has identified their gift. That's why they crucified Jesus. Not just because he claimed to be the Messiah. You understand there were other people before Jesus that said, I am the Christ. But they didn't do anything. Jesus said, I am the Christ and started healing people. He said, I am the Christ and started casting out demons. He said, I am the Christ and started walking on water and taking two fish and five loaves and multiplying and making the first red lobster. He said, I am the Christ and defeated death, hell, and the grave. And when they finished, they said, oh, he's the Christ. He the one. And we got to kill him. That's exactly what the enemy is saying to you. How can he destroy what God has put in you? Because hear me, every person has a gift. In all of your life, you will wrestle with three entities that are after your gift. God wants your gift, the enemy wants your gift, and other people want your gift. God wants your gift, the enemy wants your gift, and other people want your gift. In all your life, these three entities are after what God has put in you. God wants your gift because he's the one that put it in you. And just like anybody wants a return on their investment, how many know God wants a return on what he invested in your life? 
But the thing I love about God is you don't experience freedom until you bring your gift to him. That is the only way you can truly be free. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, and when you put it in his hands, you can find freedom. The enemy wants your gift, and here's how the enemy takes your gift. The enemy does not rob you of your gift by getting you to walk around looking evil, wearing all black and ugh, like that. No, that's not how he takes your gift. The enemy, hear me, will just tell you to use your gift for you. That's all the enemy will tell you to do. Don't use it in the kingdom of God. Don't use it to serve other people. You understand, all the enemy will ever tell you is, do you. Do you, boo-boo. Just do you. Do what you feel. The problem with using your gift for you is you can't handle your gift. Come on, your gift left to you will make you lose your mind. And how many of you ever looked at somebody that was incredibly gifted, but their gift actually became a curse because they were using their gift for themselves? Other people want your gift, and this is where it gets tricky. Because God wanted my gift, that's a good thing, right? The enemy wanted my gift, that's a bad thing. But other people wanting my gift, is that good or is that bad? Because other people want your gift. Gifts are attractive. People are connected to gifts. They're shiny. The only problem with connecting with people based on their gift, whether it be a friendship, marriage, business partnership, how many of you know when you meet that person, you don't just get their gift? You also get <laughs> their dirt. And people can handle your gift, but not a whole lot of people can handle. Ooh, I just lost everybody in here tonight. You were so happy earlier. You're like, ooh, I feel good. Yes, happy anniversary. I got a gift. Can I keep it 100? You got some dirt too, okay? Th this is what you don't want anybody to know about. In fact, this is what most people do. We love to show our gifts and hide our dirt. This is how most people come to church. This is how people post on social media. Because we don't want anybody to see any of the real us, our humanity, our flesh. We love to show the best, hide all the mess. This is, whew, let me help some married people, even though I'm only six years in. This is why dating is easier than marriage. Because in the dating process, all you see is, but as soon as you say, I do, you wake up one morning and roll over and go, what is Yo, you didn't say this at Cheesecake Factory. What? Your credit score is what? The dirt. It is the dirt. <laughs> Telling you, my wedding ceremony, I didn't even say I do. I said I dirt. I dirt. I take all the dirt. Hope you can take mine too. The challenge of life. The challenge of trying to be free. Worship team, join me. I'm landing. <laughs> It's balancing the weight, the complexities, the dichotomy, the ambiguity of the gift and the dirt. This is the challenge of life right here. It's balancing the gift and the dirt. This is why I love reading the Word of God, especially the Old Testament, because I love that God kept it so real and showed us the gift and the dirt. Because church people have a problem keeping it real. We act like we're in the witness protection program. We don't really tell <laughs> our real testimony, but oh, God made sure we saw the gift and the dirt. We saw moments of David, who was gifted, walked right up to Goliath. Hey, bro. You ain't going to talk about my God in front of everybody. No, no, not today. I'm about to knock you out. Mama said knock you out. You're going to get knocked out today. He was so gifted. He would lead you in worship and cut your head off. <laughs> he was gifted. But that same David one night was on Instagram, scrolled on Bathsheba's page, <laughs> sent her a direct message. <laughs> Say, hey, girl, I saw you taking a bath the other day. You should come over tonight. Smiley face. <laughs> King of Israel committed adultery and murder. Dirt. People like Moses was so gifted. Walked right into Pharaoh's palace without fear or intimidation. Kicked the door open. Pew! Pharaoh, cut the music off. God said, let my 
le, le, you know he had a stutter. Pop. Le, le, we want to leave. We want to leave. We sick of this. We want to leave. It was gifted. It was so gifted. That same Moses committed murder trying to accomplish the plan of God in his own strength. Come on, I could give you person after person, but you don't have to look in the pages of biblical antiquity. Have you ever looked at your own life and seen the gift and the dirt? And do you know why most of us are bound, why most of us are never free? Why most of us struggle to handle it? I'll tell you why. It's because we are trying to handle it. See, the whole time I've been preaching, I've been trying to hold this heavy dirt and hold this gift and hold this microphone. I've been struggling the whole time trying to carry all of this. And this is a picture of so many of our lives. We're trying to handle the gift and handle the dirt. And you were never supposed to handle it. It was never supposed to be in your hands. Come on, you want to see true freedom? You want to know what freedom looks like? Freedom is when you take your dirt and you take your gift and you put it out of your hands and you put it in the hands of the God that knows you, the hands of the the God that formed you, the hands of the God that loves you, you got to get it out of your hands if you want to be free. You can't control it. You were never supposed to control it. Get it out of your hands so you can have freedom. Oh, come on, church. I'm telling you, life is predicated upon whose hands you put something in. Oh, it matters whose hands you put something in. You don't believe me? A basketball in my hands is worth $25. That same basketball in LeBron James' hands is worth $410 million. Because it all depends on whose hands you put something in. Come on, you take a tennis racket and put it in my hands, I'm going to swat mosquitoes. But that same tennis racket in Serena Williams' hands is a Wimbledon championship. Because it all depends on whose hands you put something in. In. Come on, a paint and paintbrush in my hands will create beautiful stick figures. But the same paint and same paintbrush in the hands of Picasso or Rembrandt will give you a masterpiece that will take your breath away. It matters whose hands you put something in. Come on, if you take black and white piano keys and you put it in my hands, you're going to run out of the sanctuary. But the same black and white piano keys in his hands is playing amazing melodies, giving praise to God letting you know I'm about to land this sermon whose hands are you gonna put your life in oh come on if you take a hammer and some nails and you put it in my hands I'll build you a birdhouse but the same hammer the same nails and the hands of Jesus oh come on we got healing we got salvation we got freedom we got peace we got life we got joy we got freedom and whoever the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed. Oh, come on, somebody give God some praise in this place. Get it out of your hands. Get it out of your hands. You want to be free? Take your gift. Take your dirt. Put it in his hands. Stop approaching God like you approach people. Trying to show the best and hide the mess. You give them your gift and you give them your dirt and you say, I put it in your hands. This child, God, I put them in your hands. This marriage, I put it in your hands. This business, I put it in your hands. I can't handle it. I put it in your hands. That's when you'll be free. That's when you can worship like you've never worshiped before. It's time to put it in his hands. It's in you, but you gotta stir it up put it in his hands. I'm going to ask every head be bowed, every eye be closed in here today. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I pray in the midst of everything that was said that you spoke to the hearts of your people. Lord, I pray this would be the year we experience true freedom. Not based on trying to control it. But Lord, that our freedom would be predicated upon putting our gift, our dirt, all that we are in your hands. Just in this atmosphere, and I sense God's presence with heads bowed and eyes closed. If there's a situation or something that you know you need to put in his hands, you've been trying to control it, and no wonder you don't have freedom. But you say, you know what, I need to put that thing in his 
hands. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand as a sign to say, God, today I give up the struggle. I give up the fight. I'm putting it in your hands. Just lift it up. Yeah. Yeah, hands are going up all over this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Come with that hand lifted. Why don't we just declare this prayer to our Father. Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for dying on a cross and getting up from the grave for me. Father, today, I give you my gift. I give you my dirt. I give you all of me. I put my life in your hands, trusting that you can handle every detail of my life. Father, today, I step into freedom because I release everything into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give God the biggest handcuff of praise you got. Come on, you can do better than that. Would you give Jesus praise? Hallelujah. God bless you, Victor.